On the 31st day of October, Halloween gave to me 31 Reagans levitating, 30 pod people howling, 29 cosmic vampires, 28 bruises bleeding, 27 monster elevators, 26 Buseys haunting, 25 Isabel's freaking, 24 Vincent's farming, 23 cushions ghouling, 22 ruggers glaring, 21 babies killing, 20 horse heads snorting, 19 D's renting, 18 Franks perving, 17 angels stripping, 16 demons jazzercising, 15 runes on parchment, 14 Joseph's whispering, 13 seniors bleeding, 12 creepy masks, 11 dancing demons, 10 Catholic monsters, 9 priests a miracling, 8 Jerry's vamping, 7 Jody's oinking, 6 body swapping, 5 reeds a wolfing, 4 drunken uncles, 3 werewolf colonies, 2 spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Well, here we are, everyone. Happy Halloween. Uh, We have made it through 31 movies, and this is the 31st. And of course, every year, uh, the the rules are simple. We just don't repeat movies, and you try to make the movies a little bit uh, better as the month goes along. And this is uh, The Exorcist, of course, one of the scariest, best movies of all time. I, uh, I don't know that there is a more renowned horror film. Like I've got my personal favorites. I think the thing is probably my favorite horror movie, but boy, it's just hard to find any real flaws with, uh, the exorcist. And, you know, I go back and watch all of these movies as I'm doing these lists and it never fails that every time I watch the exorcist, I, I am just in awe of it. Uh, I'm not a particularly religious person for regular listeners of the various shows I do. Um, It is something that has been on my mind more and more of late, uh, is just the idea of religion and spirituality and so forth. But I'm not, you know, a member of any particular organized religion, certainly not Catholic. I only say that to say I don't think it matters when you're watching this. Um, Perhaps it does. Perhaps there are some people who just cannot divorce the idea that, you know, wait a second, Catholicism's bullshit, uh, from their enjoyment of the movie. But I've never had that problem. Even at my most atheist, uh, moments in my life, I have certainly found the suspension of disbelief within the context of the exorcist because everything is, is presented so matter of factly. And also because, within the context of the film itself, it's like, no, man, we don't do that stuff anymore. You know, when, uh, Reagan's mom goes to, uh, father Karras, one of the first things he says is, uh, you know, to pro- perform an exorcism, we're going to have to find a time machine and go back to the 16th century because it's just not something we do anymore. And I, I think that's one of the genius things about the exorcist is that it is the most, like practical exorcism movie where it's not just some priest wrapping himself up in the, the swaddling of the Lord to go fight evil. It is instead just kind of normal guys like father Karras is a normal dude. Who's having a bit of a crisis of faith and has just lost his mother and feels like shit about that because he didn't provide a great end for his mom. You know, she ended up dying in a place where no one realized she was dead for a couple of days. And, that sort of like anchoring in the real world with characters who do feel very real is one of the things that makes the movie horrifying. Um, it's a combination of writing and performance, and I, I think everyone in the movie is tremendous, up to and including Linda Blair, um, who, you know, I, I go back and forth with the child actors uh, and so forth, but She's just fantastic in this, you know? I mean, it doesn't hurt that you've got, uh, you know, terrific voice work. Uh, Coming up, Mercedes McCambridge uh, as the possessed Reagan. But, you know, Linda Blair's there in the scene, and her looks, and uh, particularly that moment when she levitates and her eyes kind of roll back. um, The look on her face goes from, like, hideous to almost, you know, beatific 
uh, as she rises into the air. Um, and of course, if you've never seen it, and, and just so that we're all coming from the same place, The Exorcist uh, the, is the story of uh, Reagan and her mother, Chris McNeil, who uh, are living in Jonestown in the wake of a divorce. And uh, Chris McNeil is doing a movie there. And Reagan starts fucking around with a Ouija board. And the next thing you know, she is uh, possessed as hell. And there is a sequence in this movie of the various like tests and medical procedures that they put Reagan through in an effort to figure out what's going on. Because, you know, when she first starts flopping around and all that... The idea is, oh, she's probably having seizures and it's probably some damage in her frontal lobe. And this isn't, you know, demonic possession because that's ridiculous. And so let's exhaust all the medical possibilities. And that doesn't lead to anything. And Ellen Burstyn, as uh, Chris McNeil, goes to Father Karras, played uh, amazingly by uh, Jason Miller. And... She says, hey, my daughter needs an exorcism. And he's like, look, I'm a psychiatrist. And I'm telling you, that would be the worst thing for your daughter. But he ends up going to uh, see Reagan to evaluate her and ultimately decides, oh, yeah, it turns out we're probably going to need an exorcism here. Can't hurt, might help. And that's where we are reintroduced to Father Merrick, who we uh, are with at the beginning of the movie who uh, is on a dig in northern Iraq uh, looking for um, statuary and whatnot. And that's where we first encounter the demon Pazuzu in a terrific scene where uh, as he's climbing these stones to get to the statue of Pazuzu uh, that, you know, there's a dude with one milky eye that he passes and dogs are fighting and it's just this cacophony and all these unsettling scenes. It's just wonderful. But yeah, so Father Merrick joins uh, the fight and the last, you know, 30, 40 minutes of the movie is them conducting this exorcism that ultimately takes Father Merrick's life and forces uh, Father Karras to uh, demand of the demons to come into him instead of this little girl they do and so he throws himself out a window uh, to kill himself and thus in the possession of Reagan and also prevent himself from hurting anyone and so you know those are the broad strokes of the story but it's really the execution and, and isn't that always the case it's not the story you're telling it's how you tell it and William Freakin uh, with the script from William Peter Blatty who also wrote the novel which I haven't read and I really should they, again, ground all of this in a, a high degree of reality where this all feels very natural. It all feels very organic down to Chris McNeil's reaction of the hero. Well, how would you handle a daughter that is losing her mind and you have no recourse? You don't know what's going on. You don't know how to help her. Um, everyone you go to is telling you to go to somebody else. She exhausts all these possibilities and she's just at her wit's end. And there's a great moment where she's telling Father Karras after he initially tells her, hey, if you want my advice, what you do is you put her in an institution where she will be observed for six months straight in the best place you can afford. But in that scene, Chris McNeil says, look, I would know my daughter. And this kind of is on the heels of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which I like, where she says, look, you could bring me a duplicate of my daughter and I would be able to tell you that it's not her in my gut and I'm telling you right now that that thing upstairs is not my child and it's a really effective moment it, it's a really you know not to keep using the word but it's a human moment where somebody is just terrified and disgusted and horrified and her like exclamation when she first goes to Father Garris where she says or Father Garris where she says, Jesus Christ, won't somebody just help me and my daughter? And that's all she wants. She just wants some, she needs some answers. She needs some help for her child. And I think Ellen Burstyn is just wonderful in this. You know, and she kind of exits the movie in the last, you know, 30, 40 minutes during the exorcism, aside from 
uh, a, a one moment where she has Father Karras if it's done after he gets kicked out of the room for getting emotional with the demon. And that's when he goes back in and finds Father Merrick dead. But um, going back to the idea of, you know, it's how you tell the story, not the story that you're telling. In addition to that level of realism and the level of empathy that I think you have with Chris McNeil, uh, as well as this, you know, just horrifying transformation, uh, things to some terrific Dick Smith makeup, uh, both for Max von Sydow and for Linda Blair as the possessed child, um, that you see this kind of desecration of this innocent sweet girl into something profane. And again, I don't think you have to be religious to understand that some things are just blasphemous to the human condition, if not the spiritual one. The fact that she is stabbing herself in the vagina with a cross and then forces her mother's face into it is profane. No matter what you believe about religion or the lack thereof, that is just a, a striking image and you understand the blasphemy of it uh, on both a human and a religious level. And, and so the movie does an amazing job at that. Um, it doesn't ever rise to histrionics in this battle of good versus evil, even though that's ultimately what this movie is, is the idea of this desecrated child uh, plagued by this force of pure evil that is confronted by you know one man whose faith is weak and another man whose body is weak and between the two of them they're kind of one good priest but uh they're both flawed in some way whether it's the the the, the physical elements of father merrick and his bad heart or it's father Karras who has a bad heart of his own just not physically it, it is the the bad heart of the shaken faith um, and it's just tremendous. It, it, like the characters are so good. The themes in this movie are so good and feel so real. Um, one thing that on this watch, and I tend to watch the the version you you never seen uh, edition, the director's cut that came out. Um, oh geez, I was gonna say a few years ago, but it's probably 15, 20 years ago at this point. But it tacks on about ten minutes of of random stuff, including the crab walk down the stairs and uh, some character moments. And I like all that stuff quite a bit. So, you know, it, I, I've quoted it before, but it's the old Roger Ebert line of no good movie can be too long and no bad movie can be too short. And for The Exorcist, you could give me a four hour version and I'd be perfectly happy with living in that movie for a little while also. But on this watch, the character that I most enjoyed, I think, is Lee J. Cobb's L Lieutenant Kinderman who is a really nice guy who's trying to put things together around the edges of this story. He's kind of nibbling like at what's going on. And of course, we, the audience, know what's up. And Kinderman is just trying to figure out what happened to Burke, this director, who uh, it is heavily implied that Reagan killed, like broke his neck and threw him out the window. And... He never comes out and accuses anybody of anything. It's always questions. It's a very Columbo kind of character. But he's also a movie fan. And that sort of colors all of his conversations. It's what he loves. He loves movies. And him being this sort of warm-hearted, pretty funny, but, you know, outside observer of the goings-on and trying to make some kind of sense of it um, I found really, really interesting, especially uh, there is a running gag about what movie is playing uh, at the theater when he invites both uh, Father Karras and then um, later Father Dyer. In both cases, uh, he gives a cast that is impossible the first time. Uh, it's Othello, a, a, a and then the, the second time it's Wuthering Heights with Jackie Gleason and Lucille Ball. And in both cases, Father Karras and Father Tyre both say, I've seen it. And it's a, a great running gag, but it also gives you a, a real sense of warmth about Lieutenant Kinderman, that he is he's truly a, a good guy. And that is, uh, I, th I think, best shown when at the end of the movie, when he's talking to Father Dyer about what's going on, like, the little girl's okay now. And, like, he showed up at the moment of the exorcism, or at the 
you know, the ass end of it when all hell has broken loose, quite literally. And he knows just enough to know that whatever it was that happened in that room is a little bit beyond his understanding, and he's never going to have the clean explanation that he wants. And so he just sort of resolves that, you know, at the end of the movie when Father Dyer says, you know, the girl doesn't remember anything, and he's like, that's good, that's important. Then, you know, strikes up this sort of burgeoning friendship with Father Dyer, who probably kind of needs it because he and, and Father Karras were close, and Kinderman genuinely had an affection for Father Karras as well. And I think the two of them um, can commiserate a little bit. But it's it's interesting to me that like this movie in my head lives well beyond th- the frames of the film itself where these characters are going on and trying to find some kind of meaning with one another. And, uh, you know, we'll get to that in Exorcist 3 someday, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, Lee J. Cobb, I think, is just tremendous in this. And uh, if you've never seen the original 12 Angry Men, Lee J. Cobb was tremendous in that also. He's just a terrific actor. Um but yeah, it, it's just a movie that flows in this very organic way to an impossible situation. And that's how I think it does its rather neat trick of convincing you as a viewer that what you're seeing is authentic because the characters seem authentic, the, the setting is authentic, um, all the people that are, the, the conversations between them, the actions that they take, all of it is completely believable and completely understandable in exactly what you would expect a parent to do or a police officer to do or a priest to do or a psychiatrist to do or a doctor to do. And because all of that is grounded so firmly in reality, the stuff involving the demon makes perfect sense within the context of the movie. You can do all kinds of like, hey, wait a second, after the the film stops, but it never bothers you while you're watching it because Friedkin's a master and the script is that good. And, you know, there's a lot of talk that Freakin and, and William Peter Blatty, like, argued back and forth over uh, what the ultimate meaning of the movie was. And is it about Catholicism or is it about humanity and all that kind of thing. But whatever conflict was happening behind the scenes, the end result is a movie that is thematically fascinating and legitimately scary. There. I've never seen another movie that presents possession in as frightening a way. And many, many movies have tried. The The number of times that people have tried to rip off The Exorcist, or at least just do a possession from, you know, The Conjuring uh, to plenty of found footage movies about people who are possessed or want to be possessed. I think it was it The Possession of Michael King or The Last Exorcism. Just anytime you do this stuff, you are living in the shadow of the exorcist and no one has ever done it as well in almost 50 years. Now this movie will be 50 years old in a couple of years and it's still the best possession movie. It's still the the most frightening. It's still the most convincing. And even if you're, you know, a, a real fuddy duddy, uh, you know, as the kids say, uh, even if you're a real stick in the mud, even if you're a, a real uh, rapscallion, and don't believe in the Catholic angle of it, it's still just the best portrayal of w- how horrifying that would be. The violence of it, the the makeup effects are incredible. Uh, even just vomiting up the pea soup, and it's a simple effect. But it still works. And I I love the fact that every time you go into this room, there's more of that green shit just on the pillowcases and on the sheets and stuff where she's just oozing this shit all the time, even when the camera's not focused on her. It's just unsettling and gross and and frightening. And the fact that, you know, as Father uh, Merrick points out, like it lies, but it tells just enough truth to suck you in. And once you're sucked in, it can manipulate you. And, you know, it seems to revel in the chaos and death around it. And it, it, it just is evil. You can tell that it's evil. It's it, it's not just blasphemous. It's the ruination of Reagan's flesh. It is it is the, the rending of her soul by this thing where she's screaming, you know, it's burning. Get it out of me. 
and that kind of stuff is really effective and the the calmness the joy that it seems to have in being in control and being this source of chaos that it loves destroying reagan you know like it, you know when the demon says i'll possess the girl until she's lying stinking in the ground you know or or yelling out the sow is mine you know that kind of stuff it's just frightening you know and this goes back to what i said yesterday about invasion of the body snatchers it's this notion of something inhabiting you that takes control it's even worse if you're looking out your own eyes can't control yourself and you see all the damage you're doing to your own body and to those that you love and and being tortured along the way you know there's every implication that uh while she is you know confined within the realm of her own body that this demon is controlling that it's torturing her too that that's what that's what the demon does the demon just fucks with things and it fucks with things in a way that hurts and maims and ruins and and that's what's terrifying it is running into a creature that can't be reasoned with it just wants to sow this kind of discord and and pain and that's frightening uh, I don't know about you, but that scares the shit out of me. The idea that somebody you love becomes something, you know, not just different, but malevolent. And I don't know that there's a, a bigger fear in my life, or I, I can't imagine in other people's lives, that the people you love, the people you count on, the people whose homes that you share and all that, all of a sudden turn on you and are something else. You know, again, that goes back to Invasion of the Body Snatchers, but... In that case, they were just emotionless. In this case, they are, you know, this demon is actively trying to uh, destroy more than itself. It it just wants to cause as much suffering as possible, and and that's a terrifying idea, um, I find. And the Exorcist, you know, what else to say about it? It is just truly one of the most authentic feeling and and most horrifying movies. Uh, that I think I've ever seen. And that's why it's our special Halloween movie. Um, so if you haven't seen The Exorcist in a while, you know, uh, pick up your DVD or your Blu-ray or drop four bucks uh, on Amazon and watch The Exorcist again. It's two hours and 15 minutes of genius. Um, and boy, you could just pick uh, worse movies to watch on a chilly Halloween evening. So that's going to do it for the 31 days of Halloween this year, everybody. Uh, If you've listened to all of them, God bless you, and thanks for joining me on this ride. We'll do it again next year. Uh, Lord willing and the creek don't rise, as they say. Uh, But in the meantime, if you would, uh, if you haven't subscribed to Legion Podcasts on the podcast catcher of your choice, please do so. You can also find me doing more horror stuff on uh, the Dark Parade, my horror podcast that uh, not only has a main show every week, but a bunch of little bonus stuff along the way. So you can find that at the Dark Parade on the podcast catcher of your choice as well. Uh, I would ask that you leave ratings and reviews for both Legion Podcasts and the Dark Parade. Uh, If the mood so strikes in, it it would be much appreciated. And uh, yeah, Uh, and you can also catch up with me on uh, Twitter or on Facebook at uh, Dark Parade Pod. Or at the Facebook group, The Dark Parade. Legion Podcasts also has a group. uh, So I am there as well. I really appreciate you hanging out. I've had so much fun this year. I hate that it's over. But also, it was a lot of work. And now I'm going to rest for a while after handing out candy to trick-or-treaters. If for no other reason, you should join The Dark Parade Facebook group. uh, Because I'm going to be posting pictures of me handing out candy as Sasquatch and my little nephew... Uh, who will be Captain America this year. So have an amazing Halloween, everybody. Uh, Go out there, enjoy yourselves, take care of the kids. Uh, If there's trick-or-treaters in your neighborhood, don't be that jerk that turns off the porch light and don't give out candy. Go buy some candy. Give out some good candy to these kids. They need it. They're they're deprived of preservatives and sugary foods. (laughs) You ask any doctor, they'll tell you that. And that's it until 2022. Uh, When we do another 31 days of Halloween, Uh, thanks for joining me, everybody. Have a great and happy Halloween.